Good afternoon. How is everyone today? Do, do we think spring is finally happening out no. there? No. I, you know, I don't know what coat to wear. One day I'm overdressed and the next day I'm underdressed. But, you know, we can't complain. It's, it's uh, terrific. And what a great uh, afternoon to be here to celebrate the Norman Alicia Boak Lecture. And uh, I am uh, Dean Eileen Sullivan Marks of the NYU Rory Myers College of Nursing. And so uh, thrilled to uh, have you here with us, special guests. I know we have a number of students um, in the room from Dr. Mary Brennan's class. And um, so that's fabulous. Thank you for coming. And what a wonderful occasion is that we do this uh, uh, in April. Um, we're very grateful for the uh, friendship and support of Norman and Alicia Volk, um, and uh, who have been highlighting uh, geriatric care and supporting geriatric care in a series of these wonderful uh, lecture series. And I'm so excited today that our speaker, uh, Anne Montgomery, is here. I hope she won't tell any special stories of our time together. Um, when I was a Health and Aging Policy Fellow, and she was a uh, staff for Senator Cole, and, and, uh, um, and how she taught me what to do. Um, but you'll hear more about that. Um, I'm here mostly to introduce um, Dr. Tara Cortez, who is our uh, professor of clinical nursing in geriatrics, as well as the executive director of our Hartford Institute of Geriatric Nursing. Uh, Tara is um, usually is the host um, for, for today and for this lecture. Her leadership is really amazing. She um, also has been a health and aging policy fellow um, in Washington, D.C., and has worked as well with Anne Montgomery and her work there. And so she and I um, will be students like you are as we hear uh, Anne today. But Tara has done fabulous work and continues to be supported in her work to really drive geriatric care to where it needs to be in the community, with the people of the community, along with all health professionals working together to support um, the healthiest of our elders. And she's recently been tapped um, um, through a, uh, a state uh, grant to, to continue her work and as well as she's been uh, recognized nationally. So with that, I'd like to um, ask Tara to come up uh, as uh, a change agent to introduce another change agent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eileen. It's always, this is a, a favorite uh, event every year. It's um, our 10th annual uh, Volk Lecture. And we always love to see people here, and, and always we always have wonderful speakers, and today is certainly a real highlight having Anne Montgomery with us. I, I, I always take this opportunity to say a little bit about the Hartford Institute, because I want to be sure that everybody knows what it is and what, we, what the Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing does, so I'll take my opportunity for a few minutes of PR. Uh, for more than 20 years, the Hartford Institute... Um, for geriatric nursing at the NYU Rory Myers College of Nursing, has committed itself to improving life for older adults by ensuring that they receive informed, thoughtful, and evidence-based care. With roughly 10,000 people a day, I'm sure you've all heard this um, statistic, but I love to say it because there's a lot of people who don't know this yet. 10,000 people a day in the United States turn 65. Our mission and um, it, it's the imperative of our mission is more important than ever, and we follow through on it very, very closely. We draw upon world-class educators and researchers to educate the healthcare workforce about age-specific care of older adults. Caring for a 70- or 80-year-old is just not the same as caring for a 40- or 50-year-old. Our specialized training extends directly from the provider's office to families' needs carried out with meticulous attention to provide the very best care possible. Some of our most impactful work is, um, that we're doing at the, right now is uh, we are transforming the primary care workforce to provide age-sensitive, coordinated health care that's interprofessional and patient-family-centered. We're developing partnerships 
very important in this world today to develop partnerships with community-based senior centers and training local volunteers who in turn are educating thousands of local seniors about vital wellness topics and chronic disease management. We're also, as we continue our work in providing and producing robust online educational resources, including interactive training courses, apps on iPhones and iPads, and eBooks to prepare the workforce to provide the kind of care older adults really need. We also provide expertise to our global partners to impact the health of older adults around the world. And I just heard the other day we were talking about how many countries have accessed our website over the last six months, and the number was 144 different countries have accessed our resources. So we certainly do have a global impact and get called upon by um, global partners to work with them. We also draw upon two decades of experience in older adult health care to educate lawmakers and lend an insightful and knowledgeable voice to impact every issue involving aging Americans. So we're very cued into the policy world to make sure that we're people in Washington, people at our state level, are making the right decisions. We do believe that education, technology, and partnerships are key to the future of ensuring a vibrant and healthy older adult population. With the unprecedented demographic shifts, not just in the United States, but globally, our mission is of utmost importance today and for the future. We are leaders with expertise, both within the Institute, but also our whole faculty contributes to the work of the Institute, and a truly caring program that we're building upon every single day as we continue to expand the future, in, and our future is limitless. So the Volk Lecture would not be possible without the support of two great friends, and Eileen mentioned two great um, trendsetters. Certainly, Norman and Alicia Volk have changed and transformed the face of aging in the United States. I'd like to take this time to introduce them both. Norman. For the past 38 years, Norman Volk has been a strong and articulate visionary for improving the health care of America's older adults. He has done this through the leadership of the John A. Hartford Foundation and his active membership on the boards of a number of leading health professional universities and institutions. Mr. Volk served as a member of the New York State delegation at the White House Conference on Aging in December 2005 at the invitation of the Governor of New York and the New York State Office of the Aging. Preliminary meetings were held in July and September 2005 in preparation for the four-day conference in December. The important event, this important event occurs every 10 years and is attended by top leaders from each state chosen for their outstanding work on behalf of the nation's older adults. Mr. Volk has been on the board of NYU Myers since 2005. He's on the advisory council of Stanford University Center on Longevity. Norman was and is instrumental in leading efforts to transform our nation's health care for older people by helping to build academic capacity to produce geriatric professionals in nursing, medicine, and social work, and on putting geriatric expertise to work, investing in more direct downstream efforts to redesign systems and of care and to promote needed policy changes on behalf of older adults and their families. And if you sit in any room that has people in the area of gerontology sitting there, and you ask them how many, how many of you have been affected by Norman Volk, every hand in the room goes up because he has touched so many people across this country in both nursing education, medical education, dental education, social work, uh, all health professions in the educational systems and also in practice. Thank you for that, Norman. About Alicia. Alicia, we're grateful to call you a friend of nursing. She's an independent art advisor and former president of the Hermitage Museum Foundation and formerly the head of client services at Christie's Auction House. In addition to supporting NYU Myers, Alicia also serves as a board member for the Commission, I'm sorry, for the Connoisseurs Circle Executive Committee at NYU Institute of Fine Arts. Through Norma and Alicia's steadfast commitments to aging issues, they promoted nursing, geriatric nursing, and medical advances to benefit older, older people. With great pleasure. I now invite you both to the podium. We 
we would just like to say how grateful we are to all of you for coming today. We know your schedules are very demanding, but uh, it means a great deal to us. Thank you. Hi, gang. <laughs> it's wonderful to see so many of you here. Many of you have attended many of these lectures over the years, and uh, I know we have uh, the students, most of whom are, I believe, at the back uh, above the baccalaureate level, masters uh, level, and beyond. Terrific. Now, before uh, maybe I'll talk for a New York minute. But, but, but before we do that, I would just like uh, uh, to have you look at a two-and-a-half-minute clip of a trailer. And it's a film uh, by Caroline Jones, who is a dynamic photojournalist and documentary filmmaker. And she began a project years ago interviewing maybe 75 different nurses uh, for a publication and then decided to edit that down to five uh, called the American Nurse Healing America. Uh, and uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, I, I hope you can access it. I don't know. Can you get that on Amazon or YouTube or one of those things? Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's well worthwhile seeing because it shows the diversity of the nursing profession in areas that you may not think you know, people need to be paying much attention to. So um, why don't we sh show that, that clip, if we could. So Caroline Jones, the documentary filmmaker, had shared with us years ago that she had gotten breast cancer, and when she got breast cancer, she had to go in and she was receiving a lot of treatments, and through that she became very frightened and was feeling very uncertain about her future. And she said through that process she started really becoming emotionally attached to the nurses. And so she said through that she felt the nurses really had saved her. And from that she decided, I need to know who these incredible human beings are that saved my life, and hence this documentary. So it's a Fascinating story. Eighteen was a uh, difficult year for me. I had a, a really bad motorcycle accident, and um, I knew what it was like. <clears throat> Sorry, I found out what it's like to to need care, you know, to be helpless, and it wasn't good. care of people that have committed such horrific crimes but when I'm at their bedside I'm taking care of just another human being I think it takes a certain kind of nurse to calm people and say we're gonna do this together I'm not leaving you and you're gonna be able to do it I was always a helper and you know when I was sitting in anatomy class I can relate to it because the things I've learned as an auto mechanic kind of relax there's nothing more intimate than being in someone's home no matter how good I fix the car Nothing, Nothing stays small anymore, and the same thing is happening in health care. It's just a baby. Animal therapy is very beneficial to young and old. My dream is this work will continue on. Sometimes it's hard. It sometimes feels like I would have to be less of a nurse or less of a soldier to maintain a relationship. So far, I've chosen to be a nurse. People that work in this profession can't go to their friends and discuss their day. Most people do not want to deal with a lot of things that happen.
So we recommend that you figure out a way to access this. It, it ran in New York City in several theaters for a, a fairly significant amount of time, uh, and it's a real eye-opener. Um, so I think all that I would just like to say in a brief moment uh, is that, uh, you know, Alicia and I have felt forever uh, that nurses are the glue that holds together our health delivery system. And it's going to be ever more true going forward. Uh, we all recognize that tectonic plates are shifting underneath our feet in terms of health delivery systems and all that's happening with mega mergers taking place, you know, facilities opening up on in, in health clinics on the street level, uh, and mergers, and the like of uh, Walmart trying to combo up with Humana to try to deliver health care in their facilities, and uh, to have CVS talking to Aetna, the insurance company, I mean, just hang out of your hats. This stuff for the next couple of years and I, I, I look at that as an opportunity, particularly for the graduates, nurses who are here, uh, as being you know, a, a tremendous opportunity. Um, you're going to see so many different things that you're going to be able to do in a variety of settings that you probably never thought you would necessarily want to think about. And I'm a firm believer in, in serendipity. So, you know, as you go out now and try to create a career trajectory for yourself, just embrace serendipity should it happen. And if it does, be nimble. Act on it. And be very confident in terms of your leadership because the fact that you're here at NYU already means that you are the cream of the crop. And you, you need to relish that. Uh, but you then also need to take that and run with it uh, and become the leaders that we're going to need for this next iteration of health delivery. So um, I think you know, we're very proud of our relationship uh, with, with NYU over all these years, and now we're counting on you. And just be open to opportunities. Thanks. Thank you, Norman. No matter where you are, no matter what you say, you impart tremendous wisdom, and you always are inspiring, so we appreciate your kind words. I've got one piece of housekeeping. If anyone in the audience needs continuing education credits for nursing, please put up their hands, and people along the sides, <laughs> our, our, our staff along the sides will pass out um, uh, your, your CE forms. Thank you. Keep them up until you get your paper. Now, it is my great pleasure. We've had the trailer, so now we come to the main feature. <laughs> and it is really a pleasure to introduce Anne Montgomery to you. As Eileen said, um, we both got to know Anne while we were Health and Aging Policy Fellows. And I just, well, I, when I met Anne, she was already at the Alterum Institute, which is this tremendous healthcare think tank in Washington, just full of bright people. And Anne is one of their stars. And, uh, she never says no. She always is open to having a discussion, a dialogue, and whenever I talk to her, I'm fully inspired and have a whole other idea about how to go about and approach something that I thought there, was, there were no approaches for. So it, we're, we're really honored to have Anne today. Anne oversees a portfolio of research, policy, and advocacy at the Alterum Institute in Washington. Her work is aimed at coordination of medical care and long-term services and supports for the fast-growing population of older adults. She has two decades of policy experience working on Medicare, Medicaid, and related programs. She served as a senior advisor for the U.S. Senate Special Committee on Aging. She was a legislative aide for the House Ways and Needs Committee and a senior analyst at the U.S. Government Accountability Office and much more. Ms. Montgomery is a member of the National Academy of Social Insurance, Academy Health, and the American Society on Aging. Her master's degree is from Columbia University, her bachelor's from University of Virginia, and she's taken gerontology work at Johns Hopkins University. 
Today's lecture will focus on how current payment models can be adapted to meet the needs of a much larger population of older adults living with chronic conditions and functional limitations, and the importance of taking a proactive role at the community level to help develop a better delivery care system for older adults. And it is truly my pleasure to welcome you to the podium, and let's give Anne a warm welcome. Good afternoon, friends. Um, <laughs> first of all, I want to say how pleased and how proud I am to be here. Uh, Eileen Sullivan Marks and Tara Cortez are both multi-talented, amazing women. They're leaders in nursing, leaders in the field of aging, in academia, in service design and delivery. And thank you so much to the Volks for your long-standing work. I'm 100% confident that there are many leaders of tomorrow in this room, and uh, from the video that we just saw, the trailer, obviously you all are heroes. So I've been thinking about what to say uh, for some weeks now. There's a whole lot to discuss. First, just to set the stage, this slide tells you a little bit about Alterum and the program to improve elder care, where I work and why it is such an interesting and amazing place to be. We're researchers and we're analysts and we try to think through complex problems in a big picture framework, recognizing that our healthcare system is in fact very pluralistic, multifaceted, and just plain complicated. Adding to that complexity is the fact that developments occur very rapidly these days, given that we have 24-7 communication and conversation. That impacts a great deal, including health policy and healthcare. There's a huge amount of intensity, and you can see that, here from the photos of town halls where members of Congress had to face their constituents last year. Many of these constituents were very unhappy with the prospect, which was then on the table, of repealing much of the Affordable Care Act and totally refashioning the Medicaid program. These congressional actions, in other words, produced a whole lot of public reaction. And that turbulence really has not died down. Populism is a major driving force in many political systems today, including the U.S., and I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. It's important to note that populism is not just authoritarianism. It certainly can be that, but populism can also be progressive. Fundamentally, it is a political strategy that is designed to appeal to the interests or the prejudices of ordinary people. Okay. Our surging populism suggests that we need to work harder, I think, to achieve consensus and dig deeper to locate common values that we can use to ground policy that benefits ordinary people. And it is indeed possible to do that, as we can see here. Common values that we've always held dear in the U.S. are life, liberty, and security. These are core themes in our founding charters, as well as the 1948 International Human Rights Charter that is depicted here, which the U.S. had a major hand in crafting after World War II. Eleanor Roosevelt was the first chair of the United Nations Human Rights Commission. For older persons, these core values translate fairly readily into good access to health and long-term care, which are essential to life. Second, liberty requires a measure of financial stability, which makes independence and autonomy possible. Third, security requires housing for security of person. These are the things that we can have at the back of our minds every day when we think about programs and craft policy solutions to improve them and adapt them. Wait a here. There. I entered the policy sector in 1998, 20 years ago, when I started working for the Health Subcommittee of the House Ways and Means Committee. The Democratic congressman who served as ranking member was Pete Stark of California, and he was a powerful politician, somewhat feared because he could be irascible. He was, and he still is, a brilliant man with a passion for Medicare, and his staff director, Bill Vaughn, was a walking Medicare encyclopedia. It was a tremendously interesting place to learn the ropes, and as I did, since we all bring our personal experiences and passions to what we do and how we do it, in the back of my mind, I was thinking about my mother. That's Carol Idle Montgomery. At that time, my mom was a Medicare beneficiary. She qualified not because she was 65, but because she was disabled. She was in her 40s when she developed MS, and it was the chronic progressive form of the disease. 
It turns out that as wonderful a person as my father is, he's now 91 years old, that's Hale Montgomery, he was really not cut out to be a caregiver. And I was working more than full time, and my younger sister was in California. So we embarked on a quest to find good paid caregivers, and as my mother became increasingly challenged by disabilities, we needed to find the people who could work full days and finally overnight. And there were quite a few nursing tasks involved. Many of those paid caregivers were immigrants. Across the U.S., one in four direct care workers are immigrants. In fact, in New York, about 40% of the direct care workforce is foreign-born. In the nursing workforce, the figure is about 15%, and overall immigrants comprise about 17% of the healthcare workforce today. We know that immigration is very intertwined with populist rhetoric. We also know it's a key issue to continue talking about and working on because immigrants play an important role in workforce adequacy, particularly in the long-term care sector, as this slide depicts. Long-term care is what my mother most needed on a day-to-day -day basis, a mix of nursing care and personal care. She also needed acute medical care from physicians and specialists, particularly in times of crisis, but that was a relatively small part of what she needed for the 25 years that she lived with MS. And I think you all know the rest of this story, which is that what we discovered is that there is no organized, affordable, long-term care system at hand. So without completely realizing it at the time, that dilemma is what launched me on my policy career, a personal and professional quest to analyze how to bridge what medical providers do and what many talented people and organizations do to provide community-based social services and supports. Got to go backward here. There we go. First, we should take a look at where we are on the budgetary front. We created this slide for an article on the 50th anniversary of the Older Americans Act for the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015. So it's a little bit dated, but even with that, welcome uh, modest funding increases in the recently enacted two-year budget deal, the overall pattern really hasn't changed. And that pattern illustrates how we invest our public dollars mainly on the medical side of the house, and very little on the social services and support side. Meanwhile, we have a rapidly growing population of older adults, and those are the green bars. The bottom line is that there remains a stark imbalance in the way that we are allocating taxpayer dollars to medical care as compared to social services and supports, and it is the latter that is most suitable for addressing social determinants of health, and which are the essence of community-based long-term care services. That would be respite for family caregivers, personal care in the home, transportation for people who can't drive, nutrition services delivered to the home, and a lot more. Older Americans Act funding is in fact declining relative to the steady increase in the older adult population, and its funding isn't adjusted for inflation. And meanwhile, Medicare spending, which you can see in the blue line, is on track to double again by 2020, having already risen by 100% between 2005 and 2015, and that is not sustainable. Okay, so my mother passed away in 2003, 15 years ago. That raises the question, has anything changed? The answer is yes, we've made some progress, but not enough. So let's talk about some of what we've accomplished in that period and then move on to what, I'll, what we still have to do. And I'll approach this through the lens of public policy. Back in 2003, Congress enacted the Medicare Modernization Act, which is best known for adding a prescription drug benefit to Medicare, the Part D program. That was a watershed, and it didn't come easily. It came with a lot of drama, late-night votes, some serious sausage-making, compromising, arm-twisting, hand-wringing. Probably sounds pretty familiar. Adding prescription drug coverage was considered to be the biggest reform to the program in its history and at the time, and I think that still holds. Congress was willing to make a big leap and to commit to spending hundreds of billions in taxpayer dollars on a benefit for seniors that had been missing since Medicare was enacted in 1965. The Part D benefit program, which began in 2006, has limitations that we're still working to address, notably the fact that there's a coverage gap, usually called the donut hole, in the middle of the benefit, where the program doesn't pick up all drug costs. So one takeaway is that even when policy is groundbreaking, there are going to be things that are not perfect and things that are not finished. In fact, in a few minutes, I'll talk a little bit about how Part D and one leading model of care for older adults, the program of all-inclusive care for the elderly, really conflict with each other and how we might be able to resolve that conflict. Next, I'll touch on another major law that changed the Medicaid program a great deal, the Deficit Reduction Act of 2005. 
The DRA ushered in a new optional benefit that allows states to provide home and community-based services in, um, in, in lieu of nursing home care for all of those who need that kind of care across the whole state. So it was a new permanent option, not just a waiver where you have to basically confine it to a few people and go back to CMS to ask over and over. It really did begin to expand the Medicaid program and to move it from a nursing facility-oriented program to one that is more based on home and community-based services. So I hope these examples give you a sense of how federal and state authority can be expanded and the important gains that can be made when Congress decides to add new services and new funding. Now we'll fast forward to the Affordable Care Act of 2010. The political drama around that law is ongoing, something like Groundhog Day. <laughs> Rather than turning the page to a new era of broader coverage, either through Medicaid or with subsidies for insurers provided through state exchanges, and according to standardized packages and stable benefits, we're gradually turning the page back. So eight years after the ACA became law, we have a very fluid situation where plans sold on state exchanges are rising in cost. The individual mandate for people to purchase health insurance will be gone by 2019, and the core essential benefits package can be bypassed in various ways. Fortunately, the Medicaid expansion is faring somewhat better. So there are 18 states that haven't yet expanded Medicaid to include people up to 138% of the federal poverty level, or 16,643 for a single person. In those 18 states, the Medicaid income cap is still at 100% of the poverty level, which is $12,060. But in the 33 states where Medicaid expansion has occurred, which includes New York, I would argue that some of the stigma around having coverage through Medicaid has receded. The more people understand the program and what it does, the more they like it, because it tends to offer comprehensive services with no or very low co-payments. Now let's focus on long-term care in the context of the Affordable Care Act. Most people don't even know that there was any long-term care policy included in the ACA. I was lucky enough, as Tara mentioned, to be on Capitol Hill starting in 2007, working for the Senate Special Committee on Aging, chaired by Herb Cole of Wisconsin Picture Here. During the run-up to the ACA, we decided we would really put pedal to the metal and see if we could make some progress on long-term care by inserting about five bills that we'd written into the ACA. So there's a reason that the Affordable Care is uh, so lengthy. People like Senator Cole came along and said, aha, we'd like to add something to that package, and we did. In fact, we inserted a lot of policy, a substantial bill on nursing homes, some great new workforce programs, which Congress later declined to fund, but which I think it's fair to say encouraged HRSA, the Health Services Resources Administration, to establish the GLUT program or the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. I know that NYU has an amazing GLUT program that Tara and Eileen could tell you about, and I hope that they do. I highly recommend that you learn about it. We also created a national background check program that gave states modest funding incentives to streamline and improve their procedures for, long -term care, for the long-term care workforce across a range of facilities and settings. At this point, there are quite a few advocates who are recommending that we make such background checks mandatory to do all we can to keep those who would abuse and prey on vulnerable elders and people with disabilities out of our workforce. Finally, we wrote a major expansion of the 1915-I Medicaid state option that I mentioned a couple of minutes ago to allow states to scale their home and community-based programs a great deal more, to use this authority to expand enrollment to whole categories of individuals across the state if they so chose, say, all individuals with a severe mental illness up to either 150% of the federal poverty level or as high as 300% of supplemental security income or $2,250 a month. As of 2016, 18 states had adopted the 1915-I program. Along with that, we adopted an initiative called the Balancing Incentive Program, which gave states slightly higher med federal Medicaid funding if they agreed to make streamlining infrastructure improvements in their home and community-based services systems. This slide is pretty hard to read. I realize that. But what it shows is that under the Balancing Incentive Program, New York was eligible to pull down nearly $600 million in Medicaid additional payments the most of all the states that participated, starting in April 2013 and running through September 2015. One of the improvements that states were asked to make in New York did this was to create no wrong door eligibility enrollment systems, and another was standardized assessment procedures. Eighteen states ultimately participated, and most of them made substantial progress 
in building better infrastructure and in expanding their home and community-based services to many more state residents. So at this juncture, a group of us are working to see if we can build interest in developing a second version of the balancing incentive program, BIP 2.0, if you will, which would have a whole new set of infrastructure improvement targets. I want to mention that politically, all of this policy was welcomed by Democrats and Republicans, very red and blue. So even when calls for the repeal of the ACA were at their most frenetic, these provisions were fine. And that's a good sign, I think, for development of long-term care policy going forward. One more key program I want to mention is the Community-Based Care Transitions Program, or CCTP for short. That was a five-year demonstration. It provided funding to area agencies on aging to provide care transition services to high-risk patients leaving the hospital, and it was groundbreaking. It hasn't been comprehensively evaluated as to the real lessons learned on the part of community-based organizations, mainly AAAs, area agencies on aging, that were trying, many for the very first time, to align what they do to keep people safe and stable in their own homes with what hospitals do. Rather, the formal evaluation focused narrowly on all-cause readmissions, which is really only a small part of the story. So we hope to be able to tell a broader story in the months to come by surveying CCTP sites to find out more about what really happened. Since the ACA, two other laws have been enacted that have significant implications for the long-term care policy arena. One is the Chronic Care Act, which became law as part of the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018, the major two-year budget deal that has been in the news a lot lately. There are a host of helpful incremental Medicare provisions that are embedded in that law. One of those will give Medicare managed care plans starting in 2020 the ability to offer non-medical supplemental services, which would be AKA long-term care, to beneficiaries who have chronic conditions. It's a subtle, but it's a very important shift. For one thing, the Medicare Advantage is huge. The Medicare Advantage program is huge. It's got 19 million uh, beneficiaries enrolled, and that number is projected to rise very steeply. So Medicare beneficiaries with chronic conditions, which for all practical purposes is tens of millions of seniors, will begin to have better access to supplemental benefits that, quote, have a reasonable expectation of improving or maintaining health or overall function. That's the statutory language. So really, for the first time in Medicare's history, we may actually see long-term care services, such as respite and caregiver supports, home improvements that enhance safety, and transportation to wellness activities offered by Medicare Advantage plans. A lot will depend on the guidance that is issued to shape how these services are offered and to whom. A postscript to this story is that we can't stop with Medicare Advantage plans, meaning we want long-term care services to be available to seniors who are enrolled in other parts other parts of Medicare, whether that's an accountable care organization, traditional fee-for-service Medicare, or some other program, who will need long-term care on a reliable, affordable basis during the age wave. If we don't do this, we will essentially force people to spend down to severe poverty, because that's what's required to qualify for Medicaid. To get long-term care services through Medicaid, your total assets cannot be more than $2,000 under federal law. Moreover, Medicaid is not a program that is designed to absorb the very large boomer cohort of which I'm a member that will need long-term care on a mass scale, or succeeding large cohorts like many of you in this room, the millennials. If you look at the second bullet on this slide, um, that's another important law, the IMPACT Act. It was approved in 2014, and it calls for nursing homes, home health agencies, and rehab facilities to start recording functional status and cognitive impairment as part of standardized assessments. These are proxies for disability and will be part of electronic health records that post-acute care providers will be required to keep for the Medicare beneficiaries they serve. This requirement kicks in starting next year. That's good news, I think, uh, for those of us, like everybody in this room, who know that we need to track and treat functional disabilities and cognitive impairment as closely as we do medical conditions in a population of older adults. I also want to note that both the Chronic Care Act and the Impact Act pass with huge bipartisan support, and it signals that policymakers, I think, are aware of the age wave. And although maybe I'm being a little bit optimistic, I think it's also a recognition that where older adults are concerned, policymakers are beginning to understand the need to take into account not just acute care needs, but a much broader spectrum that extends to and affirmatively includes the social determinants of health. As a quick reminder, here are some of the major social determinants, and those in red are the most important to older adults. These factors are going to get a lot of attention in the coming months. For one, 
There is the fact that the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation is getting ready to roll out the Accountable Health Communities demonstration later this year. It's a five-year initiative, and it's designed to give healthcare systems working with community-based organizations funding to develop better infrastructure for systematically identifying and addressing beneficiaries' health-related social needs, and whether these can impact, if, if you address these, whether that can impact total health care costs and reduce inpatient and outpatient utilization. There are two tracks, an assistance track, or one that basically screens beneficiaries considered to be at high risk with information and referrals to address identified needs. And the more substantive track is the alignment track, which asks hospitals and community-based partners to try to ensure that community-based services are available. The catch is that there is no new funding for the community services, so that's something that we have to work on. An important aspect of social determinants is that policy and program solutions for addressing them are beyond the reach of a strictly medical model which focuses on fixing individual impairments and which for patients is often framed as a personal responsibility. Those determinants which surround us and shape us in very profound ways are frequently beyond an individual's immediate direct control. In fact, addressing them cost-effectively and efficiently requires collective action and shared responsibility, a social model. And in this regard, it's good news that the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine will shortly launch a study on integrating social needs care into the delivery of health care. It's an effort that's being championed by the social work profession, and it's going to take a careful look, not only at the role of social workers in identifying and delivering health-related social needs care, but also doctors, nurses, community health workers, and trained volunteers. It will examine linkages to community-based organizations and services and the role of hospital community benefits. I think it's interesting that for a long time, the disability community has embraced a social model and shied away from a medical model. In part, this is because a social model values human assistance and relations of care, which, if you think about it, is the essence of long-term care. Equally important, where there are barriers in society that create disabilities, whether those are physical structures or discriminatory attitudes or something else, the disability community frames these as locations of change. So the question arises, in an era when we have a convergence of individuals with disabilities who are now living long lives and a growing population of able-bodied older adults who will acquire disabilities as they become frail, how can we help our communities become locations of much more social change? This is when we pivot to talk about some of the most promising models of care for adaptation and how our major programs, Medicare, Medicaid, and the Older Americans Act, can be substantially re-engineered to enable creation of scalable, community-anchored elder care systems. First, I'd like to stress that for effective design and delivery of services to a growing population of elders who want to age in place, we need to think deeply about local resources and local assets, workforce supply whether there are waiting lists and services gaps, and what the baseline patterns of utilization of various services looks like. Thinking in local terms is key, because once you need daily or near-daily assistance with activities of daily living, that kind of care, by definition, has to be available in the area. It mainly has to be deployed to the home. This is a very different delivery system than what we have now, where patients are expected to come into a given medical facility or doctor's office for treatment and then leave, go home, and be more or less fine. That's not the pattern of care that most older people with chronic conditions and functional limitations require. To really incorporate community-based long-term care and bring services to elders where they are, thinking creatively is important. It really means taking a pluralistic system and making it work figuring out how to combine and make the best use of multiple streams of funding. It's a system of many parts. Just to touch on financing for a moment, let's assume that we'll have the reimbursement streams that we have today. It is possible that these funding streams could change. For example, Medicaid might shrink a lot if its funding is capped in a block grant arrangement that has little or nothing to do with the fluctuating needs and numbers of people needing services. Medicare might become a voucher program with fixed dollar amounts per person that is blind to the needs of very differently situated people. On the optimistic side, maybe Congress will enact a new social insurance program for long-term care with new revenue. All of these ideas and variations on these themes have been and will continue to be advanced and debated very vigorously. But if our major programs aren't disassembled and we don't have any major new programs that come into being and we're more or less working with those we've had for the last 53 years, 
and it becomes necessary to actually and truly bend the cost curve rather than just talking about it. How can we do that? How can we serve almost twice the number of people we have in Medicare today without exploding costs? We're just giving up and providing very few services and knowing that people will suffer and die prematurely as a result. To build new models, we can start by assembling pieces from various programs and initiatives and, ex- and, and, and initiatives. Riffing on Buck, Mr. Fuller from the slide before, that's not fighting reality, it's adapting and re-engineering it and hence building a new model. So here's a program that has tremendous potential pace. I know that Tara and Eileen are very familiar with this program, and I hope all of you are too, or if you're not, I hope you'll read about it and go visit a PACE site. They're fascinating. PACE is important because it's already a very comprehensive model that has Medicare funding, which is capitated on a per-person, per-month basis, and risk-adjusted for frailty, as well as Medicaid funding for long-term care for the low income. PACE has an 11-member interdisciplinary team and a purpose-built medical center where elders gather to socialize as well has a dedicated transportation system that takes participants to and from their homes, so it's a home and community-based model. And PACE plans are financially responsible for all services, and they have a great deal of latitude to decide what services, including non-medical service, they want to provide. There are not many barriers in, in this regard. PACE plans can if they want to, and many do, work hard to secure better housing for enrollees if they need that, or buy them window air conditioning units, really whatever they need. So why isn't PACE the most popular model of care in the country? Part of the answer is that it's not that attractive to Medicare beneficiaries. The vast majority of PACE participants are duly eligible. Technically, if you really want to, you can enroll in PACE if you're a Medicare beneficiary, a middle-class older person, but only a handful of people have done this. The reason is that the model is written into law and regulations. It's too rigid. The consequences are that for a Medicare beneficiary, the cost of enrolling are very high. I'll tell you about that because we've been analyzing one PACE program in Michigan, in Ypsilanti, Michigan, which is close to Ann Arbor. So this is um, a story about the Huron Valley PACE project. That's the Michigan PACE plan I just mentioned. And we have some funding to test how we can expand and scale PACE to a Medicare-only population, and we're working with that particular plan. We've discovered there's a major barrier in in the way, a bit like a giant boulder on a hiking trail, and it's the cost of Part D prescription drug coverage. Remember when I mentioned that Part D and PACE conflict a couple minutes ago? Here's the problem. To qualify for discounted drugs during the donut hole, and right now the discount is 65% for brand name drugs and 56 for generic drugs, a beneficiary must pay the co-pays and deductibles that the Part D benefit requires. The same applies to the catastrophic benefit, which in 2018 starts after you have spent 7500 in out-of-pocket spending. This also requires that a beneficiary pay co-pays and deductibles. So if you don't pay them, you can never qualify either for the um, donut hole discounts or catastrophic coverage. At the same time, PACE regulations stipulate that, stipulate that PACE enrollees cannot pay co-pays and deductibles. So that's a direct conflict, one that hits Medicare-only beneficiaries who might otherwise want to enroll in PACE very hard. In the Huron Valley PACE plan, the, the 2018 Part D premium for Medicare-only enrollees is $13,195 for the year, or nearly $1,100 per month. That's because PACE Part D plans have to be priced to cover the full cost of the catastrophic coverage and donut hole discounts since the government is not paying any of this cost, which means the beneficiary must. In stark contrast, the average national Part D plan premium is $420 a year. This is obviously a massive disincentive for Medicare beneficiaries to want to participate in PACE. So in thinking about this dilemma at Alterum, we decided to analyze how it might be possible to resolve the conflict and overcome this barrier to PACE enrollment by substantially decreasing Part D costs for Medicare-only enrollees. And we came up with what we believe is a flexible streamlined solution. It's a waiver. It's a PACE waiver request that asks for permission from the federal government to give Medicare-only participants the ability to enroll in a local Part D prescription drug plan rather than being forced to enroll in the very expensive PACE Part D plan as their only option. The actuarial analysis that we commissioned comes out with total monthly payments for Medicare-only PACE participants in Huron Valley. Whoops. Maybe I'll just talk there. Uh, $320, um, which covers the basic Part D premium as well as the cost of co-pays and deductibles and over-the-counter medications. 
Together, this would be rolled into a payment that participants would make to Huron Valley Pace, which would then pay the local Part D plan. So we submitted this waiver in early April, and of course we hope to get a yes from CMS, and if that happens, not only will it help seniors wanting to enroll in Huron Valley Pace, it would set a precedent across the nation. So for the last 30 to 40 minutes, we've been talking and thinking a lot about policy solutions. All of them are solid, all of them have merit, they're also very partial. And unless we hurry up, even with the solutions we've been discussing, we're still going to fail to hit the target. And what is that target? It's being able to provide good services to roughly twice the number of elders we have been serving, quite possibly with many new sources of funding and with tighter constraints on Medicare and Medicaid spending. It's a daunting undertaking if we don't have a goal and we lack a strategy. So this slide attempts to outline both. It's a strategy that we call Medicare in Communities. The physician and researcher with whom I've been working alongside during the last four years is Dr. Joanne Lynn. She's steeped in evidence, she's creative, she's a deeply committed geriatrician, she's a top-notch health services researcher. She's taken on the challenge of trying to analyze what is needed, and for the last several years, we've been essentially assembling a series of strategies that can be executed. They sound pretty simple when you examine them. For example, identifying a target population to serve frail elders who are functionally disabled, and so they need both medical and social services and supports. That's the piece of the puzzle in the upper left-hand corner. But this population is not, in fact not identified today in a logical and organized manner because that's not how our programs work. What we do instead is identify and stratify populations by age and by income. We also allow programs that serve people with disabilities to make very different decisions about functional eligibility. For example, Virginia's Medicaid program has a functional disability threshold of four limitations in activities of daily living. I should pretty much have to be bedbound to get long-term care through Medicaid in that state. This combination of enormous variability, the fact that program eligibility rules can change quite a bit and very fast, and the scale of our age wave could result in many elders not qualifying for a given program services in the future, and that would mean that they were invisible to the service system unless they were in crisis and wound up in the hospital. So as Yogi Berra said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it, meaning let's start to think in population health terms. To do that, let's start thinking about a given geographic area and the people in it and the assets. That could be a county, a town, part of a city, or a metropolitan area, or some other geopolitical unit. Within a given geographic area, we can collect and organize data to estimate, to estimate the size of the local elderly population with disabilities. With regard to services, we know these elders are going to need comprehensive care. PACE and many other models tell us that. Therefore, we need comprehensive care plans. And to do this across the whole population, you need those care plans to be accessible to providers working in a range of different settings. Looking at other puzzle pieces in this slide, the medical care that elders need is less cure-oriented and often not as aggressive as care for younger adults. Most elder need, elders need long-term care at some point. And the broader community needs to figure out how to plan for and deliver these comprehensive services from multiple providers in a way that serves this population. That requires analyzing the workforce and taking steps to address service gaps. That entails having a planning and monitoring entity that can help determine priorities and advise on running the local service system in some capacity. And if the community does a good job at this, then, see, then savings reaped from avoided high-cost care can be used in part to help buttress services that are underfunded or in scarce supply, which are often the supportive and, ser and social services. That sounds like a lot, but it's very doable, even in the unlikely places. These are elders living in Zuni Pueblo in a remote part of New Mexico, far from any major city and with no source of gambling revenue or other major economic engine. Most of these elders qualify for Medicaid, and the provider payments are low. Diabetes rates are high, and the workforce is small. These are daunting factors. But what Zuni Pueblo does have in spades is a very practical approach. It involves sitting down on a regular basis with a whole range of stakeholders, the Indian Health Service, the Senior Center staff, Medicaid staff, primary care practitioners, nurses, and more, and strategizing together on how to meet the needs of their local elders. They know every one of their elders, and the stakeholders have a common commitment to keeping them in the community throughout their lives 
and to using funds from various programs and sources in the most creative ways possible. They effectively move financial resources where they are needed most. For example, the next step, as the number of frail elders grows quickly, is to figure out how to create an assisted, assisted living type residence so that as they become frail, elders won't have to leave the Pueblo to live in a nursing home in order to receive care. Nursing homes are very far away. I have no doubt they're going to pull this off. So as I wrap up, if Zuni Pueblo can do this, we can all do it. We can all figure out ways to identify and assess our elders and work out collaborations for how to serve them in our communities and across our aging nation. Looking at this problem from a local perspective rather than waiting for either the federal government or the state government to figure it out, which may or may not happen, is my primary recommendation today. This is a book that you may all uh, want to get. I have one copy of it and be happy to send you more if you're interested. It tells you an awful lot about how to get organized at the community level. The primary author is Dr. Joanne Lynn, and I'm proud to say that I contributed to it as well. So I can't wait to talk to you all. I hope you have some questions. Thank you so much, and I'm very honored to be here. Don't go too far, because I am going to have you come. You, you, you are going to take over the podium in a moment. Thank you so much. This was just incredible, so insightful, and I think it creates a lot of, of thinking in the audience. And we are, we are welcome to have, we've got about 20 minutes for questions. So please, um, let's get an active uh, group going. This is a, an unusual opportunity to have someone with Anne's expertise up here. So please enjoy it and, and, and take, take benefit from it. What do you all want to know about, tell me what you're working on. Somebody tell me what you're most interested in. I see my husband back there, by the way. Welcome, Bob. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ab Brody. I'm one of the faculty here and associate director of the Hartford Institute. Um, so you talked in the middle about how you have to make the prior, um, the, the prior things that are already existing obsolete in order to move the field. What if those prior things are the things that are um, both commercially invested in and like our service delivery as they currently exist, our home health agencies, our nursing homes, where there's bricks and mortar or hundreds of thousands of people employed, where the, the idea that you can't actually necessarily physically change that a home health agency exists or that a long-term care agency exists, but that the paradigm of care that they use is broken. So how do you make them obsolete while maintaining the, the system that allows for you to continue delivering the care when the vested interest wouldn't allow for like a full wholesale change? That's, that's a huge question, and that's um, what I hope I shed some light on. Essentially, I think we need to move forward by combining efforts, in other words, building infrastructure that we don't necessarily have today. For example, we're working on care transitions, you know, from the hospital to the home. It's really just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. We need care plans, you know, for Mrs. Smith and Mr. Jones that follow them into whatever setting they are and where all of the care providers can access, right, so that the tailored services that Mrs. Smith and Mr. Jones need can be provided and no more than that. Right now we have an awful lot of over-delivery of care in certain sectors, and we have a lot of missed opportunities, you know, to keep people stable so that they, you know, keep cycling in and out of hospitals, in and out of SNFs, and so on. So I think our system is, is broken in the sense that it's not communicating across all of the care settings that it needs to on behalf of individuals who cross those settings and therefore we're spending too much in the wrong places. So I don't know that we need to render home health agencies or nursing homes or hospitals or any, anything else obsolete. We just need to become far more efficient than we are today. Does that make sense? Yeah. And uh, social determinants of health, you did bring them up here, and uh, evidence shows that 60% of health problems are related to 60% or more related to social determinants, where we used to always think it was the genes that were causing everything. So we, 
to integrate social determinants into health care, in my mind, requires a very active partnership between community-based resources and health care systems. And could you give some ideas or examples as to how to drive that uh, partnership? Absolutely. Um, I think there's a, a growing recognition that we absolutely have to do that because social determinants of health are beyond the individual's capacity to completely control. And in order to work them into the healthcare system, you have to increase the communication, you know, between the medical side and the community social services and support side. So how you build those particular programs in order to do that is, is the work of today and the work of tomorrow. And some of the programs that I mentioned, like accountable health communities, which will, I'm not sure if there's one in New York. I hope there's one in New York. Um, we'll be rolling out to really build the infrastructure that is lacking, and a lot of it is uh, information technology infrastructure, for one thing, uh, so that those silos are, are glued together, so that if Mrs. Smith needs housing because she has insecure housing and she keeps bouncing back in the hospital because she's homeless, let's say, or, or not very uh, securely housed, that there's an understanding of that, you know, through through the system. I mean, that's really the way that we have to tackle social determinants of health because they're they're so broad, and they are so much more important to to health um, on a day to day basis than the actual healthcare services are. Hi, wonderful presentation, and uh, I'm Annie Messi. Um, I we've got some examples in this country of uh, systems that at least look like they're integrated health systems, like Kaiser Permanente, Intermountain Health, Geisinger, those kinds of examples. I wonder if you could comment on what, what they have accomplished and what we could learn from them. Thank you for the question. They, they have accomplished a lot. Uh, I think they still haven't crossed over into the social services and supports, however, uh, there's still a long way to go. They've done a great deal to integrate the, the medical services better across, you know, medical silos. But they still aren't sort of um, sufficiently community anchored, I don't think, you know, to meet the needs of a population that includes housing, that includes transportation, that includes, you know, nutrition services uh, delivered at home. They're still not paying as much attention to those, and they haven't figured out how to do it yet. So we have learned um, from them up to a point, but it won't be enough uh, to take us where we need to go. We're going to have to do a lot more. Hi, Anne. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Kathy Pike, and I serve as the Deputy Director for the Health and Aging Policy Fellows Program. And I want to just acknowledge that you've been an incredible mentor to so many of our fellows. And... Thank you again for teaching all of us here. And uh, so I have two questions for you. One is, as we go into the midterm elections, what do you see as the possible policy priorities that we should be putting on the agenda or getting into the campaign debates and discussions? Wow. And the second is, um, we're here at the School of Nursing, and as you know, with our fellows program, we are always um, happy to take fellows who are committed to uh, issues of policy. And if you think about nurses today and priority policies, what would you want these graduating nurses to take on as some priority policy issues? <laughs> wow. Okay. So um, the midterm elections are going to be very exciting. Um, I, one issue I think that crosses everybody's mind probably is caregiving. I don't know how many of you are caregivers or you have been or you will be. I mean, you will be possibly caregivers several times in your life. So um, we put together an interesting project that you all might want to reflect on, and that was actually leading up to the last uh, presidential election. We called it the Family Caregiver Platform Project, and what we did was we built uh, a website. It still exists. It's archived. It's called caregivercore.org, and we put up resolutions and planks that people could 
figure out how to take forward to their state party platform committee and tee up. And these were regular people, like all of us in this room. They were volunteers. And we taught them how to advocate through Skype and other, you know, Zoom, other kinds of technology like that. And essentially what family caregivers do is they bring forward issues that talk about long-term care, talk about social determinants of health, talk about what the healthcare system misses. So I think that um, that is what we can all think about and what we could show up at our town halls and talk about. And if we do that, we're going to get the attention increasingly of, of policymakers, of people running for office. I think there ought to be, at every single debate, at every single town hall, questions from family caregivers about what are you doing, you know, to help situations like mine. So that's, I, I would say go out and participate. Uh, it would be my, my prediction for how things will turn out best, and no matter who wins the elections. Um, in terms of what nurses can do, I, I think nurses and social workers are the two professions that are the most important uh, in the in the age wave era that we're now in, and that will, in 12 years, uh, become the most important. You know, long-term care will begin to dwarf in many ways. I think the healthcare system. So, the breadth of your knowledge, you know, the flexibility that you have to see systems from all sides, the medical and the social supports and services sides, is, is what is most needed. And um, so the, the main thing I would wish is that uh, there be many more of you. <laughs> Along the, uh, the lines of uh, family caregiving, um, I used to do this right. <laughs> Along the lines of family caregiving, um, not everyone may be familiar with the PACE program. It's a program for all-inclusive care of elders and funded by Medicare, Medicaid. And, and it is a program in which people who um, are eligible for nursing home level of care by that state then um, can uh, remain at home. And, uh, and that, uh, but they have the center and then all coordinate services and provide it in a capitated plan. And in many places, the people who buttress the program are the family caregivers. And so uh, it's often silent when we talk about PACE, because PACE is really for the elders who are there, but it must be that there are friends, families who are, because you have to be able to remain at home safely. So safely becomes a key part of that, and a PACE provider if the person cannot remain home safely, must then provide safe care around the clock, either in the home or um, in another setting. And so that incurs cost. And so to me, it is this family caregiving that's so important um, that um, is un paid for, unacknowledged in this capitated model. And there are some states that encourage um, families um, to be involved with a, with a salary to the families mm -hmm. through Medicaid dollars. Could, can you say a little bit more about that? Because that's linking right. payment models to social determinants of health and family caregiving. Yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating model. Um, it's called um, self-directed services. So in the Medicaid program, there is an option, one of those state options I mentioned. I talked mostly about the 1915-I program, but there's one called the 1915-J, and that's self-directed services. So what you get is a payment in lieu of um, services at home, you know, provided by a home health agency or a home care agency. And the payment essentially goes to the family caregiver to provide the services uh, to that individual, or could be a friend, a neighbor, something like that. And the disability community uh, really champion this particular model, and I think it's definitely spreading in the aging world. Um, it's easier and more flexible for some people, and it's also the crux of some social insurance programs like Germany's, for example. Um, there are three options in, in Germany's long-term care social insurance program. There's kind of a nursing home benefit, a home care benefit, and a payment to family caregivers. So it's a very viable thing to do uh, if you, for example, have rural areas where there isn't much of a workforce. This is one way to, to uh, thread that needle. So I'm all for it, and I think we should have much more of it. Well, 
it was interesting to me that in the uh, Medicaid activity that was going on in the uh, re, um, Pulling Back Affordable Care Act, it was the presentation, as you say, of the disabled children and their parents and families that really turned the nation to understand that Medicaid is not about being poor. Medicaid is about caring for a variety of people as a gap measure. And that was very powerful. So I, I like the idea of what, um, as Kathleen brings up, what it is that we can showcase yes. in the elections that really becomes, as we always say, the kitchen table issue. It affects everybody. Medicaid is the largest health care program in the country, by far. Mm -hmm. And um, that's another good thing to remind people about if you go to town halls or you write letters. Uh, be active. You know, we are in an age of populism, as I said, and, and policymakers and those running for office pay attention to those who speak loudly and those who show up. And we need to show up, and we need to talk about how important it is to not only preserve these programs, but to you know substantially improve them. It makes a huge difference. It makes all the difference, I would say. Another question here. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I'm Sandra. I'm um, a part of the acute care adult geriatric program, along with many other students of Dr. Brennan's. Um, I want to thank you for your time, uh, first of all, but I think that a lot of us in the room, our trajectory is, is in its infancy. I think we have 40, 50 years of potential policy making from our standpoint, and I think that once you graduate and our providers, I think that our experience in nursing, I think we can do so much more from that provider standpoint. I think we've seen the, the level of baby boomers, and that geriatric population is not getting any smaller, and I think that... Um, there's a lot of potential in our, in our group, and so I think you should have some faith in the potential we have. I think we're going to do some good work together. I have huge faith in everybody in this room. Total. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shelley Greenberg. I also work at the Harvard Institute for Geriatric Nursing and Nurses Improving Care for Health System Elders program here. And um, thank you for uh, your words. We were talking amongst some of the faculty here. This is PR for many of the courses in the curriculum. Um, and um, it's so wonderful to have so many of our mentors and colleagues here from over the years. But uh, Mary, with your permission, I'd like to actually talk to some of you students and to say that um, recognizing that you are in the adult gerontology acute care program, this is crucial information for you all. And um, even though we're talking about a lot of primary care, long-term care, um, and community work, this is crucial. You might be the first person, you might be the first time someone brings their um, older adult to your practice, whether it be in an acute care clinic or in an acute care setting or critical care setting, emergency department, or you might find yourself in some situation where you're the one doing the first, you're the first point person, the history, the physical, the interprofessional assessment and planning, these things are all very important. You might be the first person to identify there's a social determinant of health issue and really have to do that very thorough work with the clients and their families and the caregivers and go to the next step and really um, involve the team. So um, I hope you um, take that. And, and it's not just about acute care. It's not just about primary care. This is really about comprehensive care for older adults and improving evidence-based quality of care. And um, that's it. Amen. So... Uh uh, Gene Heslin here. I'm a first deputy commissioner of health for New York State. And I came down from Albany because I wanted to hear you talk today. And I'm very thrilled to have been here uh, in this lecture. I think you hit really on some very important points. Uh, in New York, we know that there are 8 million people on Medicaid of the 19 million people we have. So it really is a critical issue for us. We also know that we have about 5.8 people working, 31 person retired right now. And in 2024, it's going to be 1 to 2.8. So we're a little ahead of the tsunami around the rest of the country. So as we're sitting in this room today, six years from now, when everybody here is a provider working, hopefully in an office like mine, I'm a primary care physician, and actually see patients still about 20 hours a week in addition to my duties in Albany, um, that you take to heart what's being said here. It is absolutely critical that a new system is developed. In terms of direct service workers, 
We're going to be completely short in New York State. We don't know exactly where we're going to get them from. We don't value them in the right way, and we haven't built coordinated efforts, and that's being looked at. We also need to do a better job with every level of service care, nursing included, because we're not where we need to be for our most vulnerable population, which will be our elderly. When people are, you know, food insecure and housing insecure, it makes a tremendous difference. Um, we work with Altarum with the Prometheus Project with uh, Medicaid. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great, great organization. Uh, we need to figure out, though, how we're going to landscape our communities, and that's one of the challenges I think that needs to happen. We currently don't really know what's in every community. We sort of have a generic idea, but then we have to figure out what the demand analysis of caregivers are going to be, and I'd like to hear your thoughts about how we can actually get to that with the data we have. One other point I will make is, is that braiding together uh, multiple sources of money, for example, USDA, housing, et cetera, there may be enough money in the system now. We just have to fix it. We're going right now in health care from a system that is truly a system where, you know, we were fixing the broken to how we prevent the people from becoming broken. And that's the big paradigm that we have to get through in all the shifts we have to make. So I'd like to hear some thoughts. Okay, I'll take a stab at that. Um, so we've been talking a lot about workforce, and you guys are the workforce for the most part of the future. And you can hear how important that is, and you can hear how difficult it is to pull programs together, particularly very large programs that, that don't change as readily as we might like them to, as quickly as we might like them to. So... That's why I was trying to stress, to some extent, the value of looking locally. Uh, we put together, we're putting together, I should say, a financial simulation tool, and it was based on some work that we did to submit a grant to CMS several years ago. And what we did was we sat down in four different communities, very different communities, so Akron, Ohio, Williamsburg, Virginia, a rural area, uh, Queens, New York, and um, Milwaukee, Oregon, which is a suburb of Portland. And we said to the providers, okay, you, you were all motivated because we knew them and we worked with them in some capacity. You're motivated to try to put together a better elder care system in your area. So can you give us some projections of how many elders you think need a combination of medical and long-term care? So two activities of daily living. And they came up with some estimates for that. Then we put together data on the uh, Medicare uh, payment rates in that area, in that county area, uh, that hospital referral region. We got the utilization data. We put together all of the services, not just the Medicare services, but the transportation, all the social services and supports. We came up with estimates for those. And we added it all up, and we got to a, a per-person you know, um, figure for a certain number of people. Then we said, okay, um, what if you change the trajectory of how you're delivering services to geriatricize the care, spend less money on hospitals, spend more money on primary care, more on home health, more on social services and supports, where would you be then? We took those estimates from the literature, and, and those are you know, considerably lower, that spending. So then you have that target that you can potentially achieve. So this is all hypothetical. This is all projecting into the future um, over a three-year period. Uh, what would you do with those savings? Would you run your program if you were able to set it up? And then what would you do with them beyond that? Well, you'd, help, you'd use them to help buttress the social services and supports that are underfunded. So that kind of modeling is, I think, essential. You really have to dig down and look at what your assets are and what your service gaps are, and do that kind of baseline projecting, targets, and then figure out where to go. And that's, I think, increasingly going to be how people figure out how to take current funding streams and make them make more sense. I hope that is intelligible, and if it's not, come talk to me more. <laughs> uh, my question was pretty much in the same vein. Um, and having had two experiences with taking care of people that uh, needed long-term care, I'm, I'm just wondering if you have uh, tried to figure out in, in, at all exactly what it costs 
to do that kind of long-term care in an individual's home. And I, I know what it is, and it's, it's really an astounding uh, amount of money. And so it's, it's good to think about what do we have to work with already, but then we also need to figure out how much per individual is going to cost, and do you have any idea about that? <laughs> and if you do, will you tell us, please? <laughs> I won't be able to quote you figures off the top of my head. I'd have to go back and, and look at them. But it is incredibly important to do those figures. Um, I mean, my mother, uh, who I talked about earlier, we worked out a way for it to be affordable for her to remain at home. She really did not want to be in a nursing home, although she required nursing home level of care probably 10 years into her um, MS trajectory, and she lived for 25 years. Uh, it wasn't easy, you know. Uh, you know, 24/7 care for one individual is um, pretty costly, you know, compared to the efficiencies that you would have in a nursing home where your staff is 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 taking care of more than one person. We were able to figure it out, um, but it isn't necessarily the most efficient way to care for everybody. So it's that kind of analysis that's. That's really important. Um, what I was talking about a moment ago was to say if you can sort of develop an, an area that you think you can make estimates of for the number of people who need this kind of care, array a basket of services, cost it out on a per person basis, take your utilization, look at the literature, see where you can save money, develop the targets, drive toward the targets and see where you get. Uh, that's where the answers are going to come. And they're not all going to be nice and neat. <laughs> Sometimes they're, you know, uh, areas that, that try this are, are not going to uh, not going to win, not going to save anything. Um, but I do think that there are considerable savings in many areas that can be had. I mean, that's what the, the literature would suggest. So no easy answers, um, and it's it's all hard work. It's all very doable. I mean, what I'm saying is that we have the pieces, we have the tools. We just need to employ them differently. All right, uh, we did arrive a bit late, but we're thrilled to be here. Uh, but from the uh, perspective of overall wellness, you know, actually, I run a uh, wellness foundation out on the eastern end of Long Island, and I think the, uh, we're very much in line with uh, Hippocrates a few years back in Greece, and the, uh, the issue was uh, what your medicine was going to be, and so he was very clear that the, uh, the answer should be food. And although at, at Wellness Foundation, we really, really focus on the younger generation, uh, the geriatric and older, well, all of them are important. And, and we, we see it, we only see, uh, edu no, I, I think you made the comment about self-care. And we see that as a, an essential part, you know, of actually we empower uh, kids with classes and programs. Uh, and then as they get older, they're actually be able to make informed decisions on, the, on what they're doing. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm with, I mean, one of, the, one of the problems in our country you know, is there basically is uh, no personal health care education. You know, we're, we're all in the dark, you know. And I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, people, when they move along, and more in geriatrics and so forth, obviously they're not as capable of taking care of themselves. But, but the extent of which uh, education of the various ways they can do that, you know, to the extent that fits into the deal. You sound like you're an entrepreneur, and that's wonderful, and thank you for your work. We need lots more of it. Um, I do know that there is a lot of work in the aging network. The area agencies on aging um, have long done a lot of preventive work. And so chronic disease self-management programs, for example, diabetes and falls prevention and much, much more are coming into their own, and they're even billable to Medicare, uh, which is kind of exciting for the aging network. So we're going to see an awful lot of that. Uh, so thank you for your work, and a lot of it will be private pay, but some of it will be able to be government reimbursed. And um, looking at the, the chart in front of us here, and Pace and Berwick and uh, Jenny Chin Hansen, both amazing people, and Jenny Chin Hansen 
I remember it was, must have been in 79 or 80, when she was running Unlock in the Asian community in San Francisco, and that was sort of the predecessor of the various pace models. So we know that that pace model was terrific, but it wasn't many years thereafter before they got waivers, I believe, for Medicare and Medicaid, and they provide a very important service, but they're like the tip of the iceberg. And so my question is, with this aging population in an ideal model, pace would have to be amped up, I'm going to take a number, a hundredfold, to really have a meaningful impact to a broad population. And so what are the headwinds that you see, even if it's only twofold or threefold, but to be able to really develop a model where it's meaningful to a broader population? What suggestions would you have? Or what are the that's a great you. question. Um, PACE enrolls now nationwide, I think about 43,000 beneficiaries. Okay, so that's a relative drop in the bucket. That's absolutely true. And um, some of the barriers I described are because it is geared toward the lower income um, Medicare population, so one that's duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. In order to make it really attractive to a Medicare population and, and reach those large numbers, you have to figure out how to deal with some of the uh, rigidities and the inflexibilities of the PACE model. So we are working on that at Altarum and the National PACE Association, which represents all the PACE plans in the country, is extremely interested in seeing PACE grow. Uh, I think they have a goal of reaching about 300,000 over 10 years. Still not enough, but that's you know becoming respectable. <laughs> and um, I would hope that we could exceed that, actually. Um, in addition to resolving the way too high Part D premium problem that I talked about a little bit earlier, um, I think there are the populations of Medicare beneficiaries who need special attention, the, the what we call the near poor, people who are just above the Medicaid income eligibility threshold, so they can't pay the full long-term services and supports premium that Medicaid uh, would pay. That's several thousand dollars a month. So how can you get states to realize it's in their interest to subsidize um, their, their inability to pay the full freight? That's a population that needs a lot of work. And then there is the population that isn't yet nursing home level of care. Isn't that disabled? But they would benefit from PACE. And these are regular Medicare beneficiaries who might need just a little bit of, of you know, help now and again. But right now they can't enroll, so how can we change that? Uh, these are policy questions and research questions that are incredibly important. Um, so that's one way of, of working directly on PACE. The other thing is to study PACE as a model of care and why it works so well, and then just export some of those lessons to, to other bigger models, like the Medicare Advantage plans or accountable care organizations. What is PACE doing right that they might be able to borrow from? So that's another you know, research and policy direction. PACE is the, is the gold standard of care, and you're absolutely right to have identified it. So we need to stretch it as, an, as a model as, as it exists today, and also export its lessons learned to other provider models. I, I would just add, as you know, Anne, in 2015, President Obama signed legislation because the, the, le the, the PACE legislation is that it is who are 55 and over, and Medicare, Medicaid, or nursing home eligible are those who are eligible for the PACE program. And in 2015, after much work that Eileen was involved with, that I was involved with, President Obama signed the bill that expanded PACE to people who are 55 and over and not nursing home eligible, as well as people under 55 who are disabled. And I still have my once a month conversation with the office, the MNCO office at, at uh, CMS, as we are still trying to work out an RFP for a demonstration on these kinds of populations. So the, the mechanism is there, the legislation is there, the policy, as you said, has to be developed, and that will happen through a demonstration project, but it's just taking a little longer with all the changes that, um, that we have. Thank you for your enthusiasm. We want it to grow. <laughs> thank you, um, Anne. And uh, thank you, everyone, for just a fabulous uh, afternoon um, in discussing um, the future.
picture and not always been creative thinking and let's have another round of applause. we can always give to students is um, how much um, when you get into policy this is what it looks like. A lot of people think it's, you know, just writing your legislation is really showing up. Yes, and, and we kind of have an aging policy fellow, which is how we did it. I ran a pension program for 10 years, and believe me, it's in the weeds. I need to announce to those of you who want to have continuing education, you need to fill out forms um, at the registration desk or pick up your completion form so you get that. And so again, I welcome everyone to the reception outside and uh, continue our conversation. Thank you for coming.